Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Steve Levitsky. I'm director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. Welcome to our Dr. Class Tuesday webinar. Uh, today's webinar is a panel on the ongoing political crisis in Peru. And as always, I am joined by my extraordinary co-chair, Professor Francis Agopian. Welcome, everyone. We're looking forward to this event today. I also want to thank our Dr. Class team with Pau Ibarra and Jillian Scale for uh, making this run properly. We would be nowhere without those two. Uh, and before I begin, let me not forget, we have English-Spanish translation. Uh, so if you want to hear any of this in, uh, in your language, just go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you can escuchar las presentaciones en castellano, vayan a donde dice interpretación en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Um, secondly, as always, we'll be recording today's webinar. It'll be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel. Sure, yes, we have a YouTube channel uh, shortly after today's session. Third, if you have questions for the panelists at any point, we welcome them. Um, send them through the Q&A function in, uh, at the bottom of the screen so that the chat function is shut down. But any questions you've got, you may send them to the, the Q&A function. And we'll have about half an hour at the end today uh, um, to, to, to send the questions on to our to our panelists. You should feel free to submit questions at any point during the panel. All right, Peru has been uh, continuously democratic now for 21 years. That is the longest period of democracy in that country's history. Peru's economy has been fairly healthy during that period. There are no armed insurgencies or serious security threats. And Peruvian society is not especially divided or intensely polarized. In short, the most common threats to democracy, economic crisis, armed insurgency, extreme polarization, are really not present today in Peru. And yet Peru's democracy seems to be destroying itself. There have been six presidents in the last six years. There was a Trump-like effort to overturn the results of the 2021 election. And the 2021 election gave rise to an extreme political neophyte, Pedro Castillo, who made previous outsiders, Alberto Fimori, Alejandro Toledo, Yanto Mala, look like experienced statesmen in comparison. And it looks like Castillo may not make it to the end of his first year in office, let alone his first term. Amid all of this, not too surprisingly, Peruvian citizens have grown increasingly disaffected with their politicians, with their political parties, with their political institutions in general. It's not hard at this point, unfortunately, to imagine an authoritarian outsider making a successful appeal, political appeal, electoral appeal in Peru. So the question is, or the question I have is, how the hell did we get here? And is it possible for Peru to escape this difficult political place and still keep its democracy? To address that question, um, or to begin to address that question, we've assembled a terrific panel of Peruvian social scientists. Now, as a side note, we realized um, in putting together this panel that we had invited, we'd invited Alberto Vergara to the last 17 Dr. Class panels on Peru. So we decided to go Vergara free today. As you'll see, it's not entirely Vergara free, but it's mostly Vergara free. We love Albert, but we, we need to expand our, our horizon. So we have three outstanding panelists. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce the three of them and then, then they'll speak. And this is in alphabetical order. So first, Gonzalo Banda is Associate Professor in Political Science at the Universidad Católica de Santa Maria in Arequipa, Peru. His research focuses on, um, among other things, on subnational governments, mostly in Southern Peru. He studied law and political science at the Catholic University in Lima. Uh, he is, in addition to, to, to teaching and studying, he's a columnist for El Comercio in Peru and El País in, in Spain. Uh, and he's a podcaster for El Comité de Lectura, where he created a podcast called El Sur Antisistema. Gonzalo is a fan of FBC Melga, um, but, uh, but we decided to invite him anyway, despite that. So Gonzalo, welcome. Uh, secondly, Rodrigo Barrenechea is Assistant Professor of Political Science in the Department of Social Sciences at the Catholic University in Uruguay. Uh, he holds a PhD in political science from Northwestern University and his research focuses on populism, on political parties and political representation broadly in Latin America, particularly in Andean subregion. Rodrigo is familiar to many of you. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the Weatherhead Center Research Cluster on Challenges to Democracy here at Harvard in 2019-2020, just before the pandemic. Rodrigo, welcome back. 
And third, Zahra Toledo is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research at Tulane University. So she is uh, sort of mid Mardi Gras. She took time out from, uh, from that to join us. So we're especially grateful. Uh, Dr. Toledo received her PhD in political science from the University of British Columbia. She studies how excluded groups ranging from indigenous and campesino communities to informal traders and small scale miners participate in politics in highly unequal societies. She's interested in particular in their capacity to influence policy outcomes and resource governance, and more generally the impact on state development. Dr. Toledo is finishing a book entitled Undermining State Authority, the Politics of Informal Gold Mining in Bolivia and Peru, which looks at the expansion of informal governance systems around gold mining and the new political enforcement dynamics that emerge from the empowerment of the informal extractive sector. She's also working on a project on how subnational political officials resolve governance dilemmas posed by the diverging interests of the central state on the one hand and uh, uh, local constituents on the other, which is a big issue in Peru and elsewhere in the Andes. Uh, I do not know what Dr. Toledo's favorite football team is. Um, I can assure you it is not FBC like that. Alianza Lima. There we go. Oh my God, really? Okay. I thought all good Peruvians were, were for sport boys. That's, that's, that's what I thought, but okay. The speakers will each go for about 12 minutes after which we should have about half an hour for, for Q and A. And Fran and I will harvest the questions and feed them to the panelists. So um, take it away, Lozell, forward to it. Hello, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you, Francis, and all the wonderful people at the Rockefeller Center in Harvard University. It's a wonderful opportunity to share with you my thoughts about our crisis. No, uh, in crises are moments, no, that pass. Uh, quickly, eventually, no? but they do pass. No? But in Peru, crisis, uh, they are our usual state of mind. No? Crisis are normal, the new normal in Peru. But we can try to explain what's going on in, in, in many ways, politically, in long term, maybe Maybe there are several explanations. For instance, the historical argument would speak about the institutional weakness and the extreme weakness of the political Peruvian parties, no? which has only go deep uh, farther in, in recent years. No? It, it's true that uh, Toledo's, Humala's government uh, were were unable to manage to consolidate themselves as uh, uh, long term parties in the Peruvian political party's life. No, but this weakness of political parties uh, has been worsening in the last five six years. No, um, I think it reached a peak when uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski only got uh, 17 lawmakers in the parliament. No, that's a, I, I think that's an interesting starting point to the more uh, complex crisis in the middle, in, in the midst of the, of the more bigger crisis, no? Uh, because a president with only 17 congressmen uh, is therefore uh, condemned no, to failure. No? Historically, you know, that's the, the path, for instance, I, I want to talk at first. Peru has had some few weak presidents who did not end well. For instance, uh, Jose Luis Bustamante Rivero at his first government, or Fernando Belaunde um, were president who were defeated by cops. And I think that it will be uh, unfair for 
Kuczynski say that it, he was the, a single case. You know, there is historical uh, evidence that uh, a president with so few lawmakers of the parliament is condemned to failure. No? Uncertainty uh, depend um, on that weakness. No? Uh, but in that crisis, I think there's interesting pointing out in the responsibility of the parliamentary majority of Fuerza Popular, the Fujimori's political party. No? One would expect that in terms of negotiation, Kuczynski and Keiko Fujimori would, would have more similarities than difference, no? But uh, the popularity and the strength of Fujimori in 2016 was very interesting point to analyze, no? Fuerza Popular went to an uh, election with a strong party and strong organizations in many regions of Peru. That's very interesting because political parties in Peru uh, are not such very good organized in regions in Peru. Um, unlike now, for example, no, Fuerza Popular is, is, is being completely uh, diminished in the regions of Peru. No? Even though I think that uh, despite of winning that election uh, in the parliament, she didn't win the presidency of Peru. And I think, but, but she, 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 I think she, she tried to do their, whatever she can. You know? uh, for instance, in the South of Peru, that it's a uh, very, very strong place for the anti-Fujimorism. Um, uh, Keiko was very competitive. No, uh, he could. Uh, I think he he almost in all regions of the Peruvian South, she almost um, had uh, twenty percent. No, it was a very tough candidate in that time. No, so Fujimorism work hardly in that election, but the results of that elections encourage political parties uh, not to negotiate. No, Fujimori, Fujimori is the emerge with its authoritarian gene. No, if you want to know what someone is really like, give uh, that person power, Fujimori is with power, uh, when they have power, show itself very authoritarian, no? I think, no? and which in the long run, it would let costly, costing um, Fujimori high level of unpopularity. No? However, I think that it, it is a word uh, it's worth to notice that uh, it's a breaking point with PPK only having 17 congressmen. That thing, that confrontation between Pepe, uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski and Keiko Fujimori was, uh, I think, that the starting point of our of this crisis, I think. And, that's the, the, the first answer, the historical argument. For the second one, I think if we can, if we could analyze what's going on now with Pedro Castillo, I think we could try to explain what's going on because elites in Peru in 2020, after or in, the, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, especially, especially, I think that's a, a huge critic for our intellectual elites. 
I think they were very disconnected of the of the masses. No, the Republican discourse does not penetrate the all almost all the majority of society. No, um, uh, because I think, and that's probably very polemic. Uh, I think that our congressmen, our lawmakers, probably are more closely. Uh, to resemble the complex diversity of interests in Peruvian society. Um, we are a society with informal economy, with uh, illegal mining. Uh, we should not expect to elect as Socratic authorities, no? That's, that's an interesting starting point. No, because I think that, that, that that's, that's uh, the thing we have to look at the mirror. No, we have to recognize ourselves in that mirror, trying to respond some answers. Um, and therefore, I think that there is a political culture in Peru that where I think we don't tolerate difference in politics. No, the difference. And in Peruvian political parties, uh, we have built these strong identities, friend, enemies, heroes of billions. And we have left that a lot of um, new politicians, amateurs, try to, to start to build in, uh, political careers without incentives because we have banned uh, re-election. And I think that's another interesting um, issue we can, we, can, we can examine, I think. And on the other hand, national politics has become more likely to subnational politics in Peru, no? Political fragmentation, uh, uh, it's supposed we, uh, Alberto is not here, but what he calls archipelago, no? Vergara uh, talks about that, no? Uh, the, the political archipelago in Peru happened many years ago in political, in subnational politics in Peru, no? Election with candidates who managed to be elected with a small percentage are things that are very common in the regions of Peru. Now, uh, in Arequipa, for example, no a provincial mayor was elected with almost uh, 12 percent. That's that's uh, the the usual thing in subnational politics. And there we have in 2021, uh, I, I think we have a, a, an election with several uh, candidates and almost everyone no more than 50 percent no that kind of thing happened a lot in some national politics and oh another thing that happens a lot of subnational politics is this kind of surviving thing no subnational politicians survive scandals politically they are weak they survive uh, public um, uh, public denounces. They survive uh, scandals. They they survive. No, they do not fall. No, they 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 are in power and they are not removed from power because they distribute government positions. You know? and I think that. If you try to explain what's going on in Peruvian politics, uh, we have to take into account all this complex historical path, this path dependence, and uh, this subnationalization of national politics. And I think that's that's what I have for now, and I will hoping to share with you some further reflections. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Gonzalo. Uh, we turn to Rodrigo Valencia. Okay, 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you to Dr. Class for uh, hosting this and for having me here. Uh, and I'll just start right away because I have only 12 minutes. So um, I want to start by remembering that uh, until recently, Peru was commended for its stability. Despite important structural problems and institutional precarity, Peru seemed to be exceeding expectations in terms of economic performance and democratic resilience. In the last five years, however, as Steve said earlier, we have had five presidents, and in the last six months, we've had four prime ministers. And on top of all this, both Congress and the executive seem to be uh, having increasing, they, they seem to be increasingly aligned with informal and or illegal economic interests that are capturing the state and, 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 that, and, that, and that are further, further eroding democratic institutions. So what is going on? Uh, there are many angles to this crisis and it is, it's impossible to cover them all in 12 minutes. So I'll focus on three points. First, I'll talk about what made proven democracy resilient until now and what changes in unwritten rules have made the system more unstable than it was before. Second, I'll talk about the emergence of new actors and in the political arena that have made the Peruvian game an even more precarious one. And finally, I'll talk about one long-term process that I think helps us explain why we're seeing the penetration of informal and illegal actors in politics like never before. Um, so uh, to start with the question of why has democracy, proven democracy, survived until now? Since 2001, when Peru transitioned to democracy after the fall of Fujimori, Peru's democracy has persisted. Um, but democracy has not held in place because of the strength and legitimacy of political institutions or because of a strong commitment by political elites to hold it in place. On the contrary, Peru's democratic institutions are weak and unpopular. And we have seen no shortage of political actors with illiberal discourses over time. If they have not been successful, if Peru's democracy has not fallen, it's because Peru's the beneficiary or Peru's democracy uh, has been the beneficiary of what Luke and Wei, talking about Ukraine, uh, calls pluralism by default. With a fragmented political field and weak, unpopular politicians, there are no actors strong enough or with the capacity to accumulate power, uh, enough power to bring down democracy. It's a low level equilibrium. Stability as a consequence of weakness. The absence of parties is the reason why democracy could not function, but it is also the reason why it hasn't fallen. Now, this kind of stalemate between weak political actors was brought to a new level of confrontation when, as Gonzalo already said, President Kuczynski was forced to resign by a pending vacancia, right, in Congress. For those who have not heard of vacancia before, it's a mechanism that is written in Peruvian constitution to remove the president from power on very vaguely defined grounds, but that had not been used, this mechanism had not been used since Peru's return to, to return to democracy. A year and a half later, a year and a half later, or after uh, Kuczynski was removed from power, Vizcarra, the new president, dissolved Congress, another extreme measure that had not been used before. From then on, political actors in Peru have been more willing to use and threaten to use the nuclear weapons of the Constitution, the vacancia, and the dissolution of, of Congress. And they have weaponized, like never before, um, different articles of the Constitution. Now they are used, this, this, these tools, the we these weapons are used as regular tools in the political game, making the, the, this, this already pre precarious situation even more precarious. Now, in spite of that, pluralism by default has persisted. In November 2020, Vizcarra was weak enough to fall, just like Kuczynski before him, but his opponents were not strong enough to hold on to power through Merino. And in the last election, we saw Peruvian democracy persist after a runoff between two illiberal political projects, Fuerza Popular and Peru Libre. The first one wasn't strong enough to nullify the results of a free and fair election in spite of all its efforts. 
And the latter, the second one, Peru Libre, was not strong enough to follow a Bolivarian route once elected, as no doubt it would have wanted to. Although this equilibrium that I've described to you was always precarious, it has become even more so as a result of the rise to power of um, two actors, one on uh, the most improvised and ill-prepared outsider to the presidency that we have had in a while, and due to the emergence of um, radical right leaders and movements that we have not seen since the 1930s. So, to talk about these two new actors. Uh, I said that we have the weakest, most inexperienced and politically disconnected president in memory. Peru has been electing outsiders since 1990, we all know that. It's a Peruvian tradition by now. If you go to Peru and during elections, you will see that every election cycle, the press and voters are betting on who will be the next outsider. Um, outsiders are those actors that are, have no previous experience in public office and that lack ties to the political levers of power when they were elected. Fujimori, Toledo, Humala, and Castillo all fell neatly in this category, in this outsider category. But outsiders can still be connected to social, economic, or cultural elites, and then can bring some of that power and connections to politics. Castillo, however, has none of these connections. In terms of distance to power, he's the most peripheral president that we have ever had, since the return to democracy, at least. This explains his extreme incompetence as a politician and his incapacity to put together a viable political coalition that can give him some resemblance of stability. This also explains to some extent its willing, his willingness to surround himself by equally inexperienced and incompetent advisors and would-be politicians. It does not, however, explain his seeming ties to uh, corrupt politicians and illegal or informal uh, economic actors. To this, I'll come back later. But let me talk about the other actor. Uh, I said we have one of the most historical, illiberal, anti-communist right-wing movements on parties that we've ever had since the 1930s. All parties and personalities in the political right have radicalized and new ones are more extreme in their language, manners, and on what they are willing to do in order to win over their opponents. In Peru, this meant they were unwilling to accept the results of a free and fair election, they tried to nullify it, and then used every possible excuse of which the government offered many to try and push a new vacancia. This sector of the opposition sees communist plots in every corner and in every move made by this chaotic administration, further feeding polarization. But why are right-wing movements and parties and personalities going through this process of radicalization? This is not a proven phenomenon, but rather a global one. And there are books and papers that talk about this. So I won't talk about the causes of the phenomenon. But in terms of consequences, as consequences go, this has added a more, more instability to, to the political system by further increasing polarization, mostly at the elite level. Politicians, media, and so on and so forth. The discourse in Peru is highly polarized. Even though, if I think, and we can talk about this maybe later, the general public, I don't think, is as polarized as elites are. And finally, my final point, I said that uh, I wanted to talk about this presence of informal and illegal actors uh, or uh, informal illegal um, uh, economic interests predating the state and undermining democratic institutions. Uh, to this, I have to, like, we, should, we should turn to a much like deeper, uh, to, to a much deeper process. Um, and this is part of a problem that I'm tackling with Alberto Vergara in a project about democratic erosion in Peru. These are ideas uh, in process. Okay, so political scientists are all familiar with the notion of brown areas, right? O'Donnell spoke of brown areas, to refer to those cases where the rule of law did not function within countries in Latin America. Although O'Donnell thought of this mainly as a lack of constraint on elected officials at the national level, brown areas could be more broadly conceived as those spaces where the rule of law is absent from economic and social life within a territory. Yeah. Since 2001, Peru's two pillars have been democracy without parties and market economy without rule of law. The country has left entire areas 
of its territory and entire sectors of its economy in the hands of informal and illegal powers, education, transportation, mining, etc. There's like a parallel order that takes place on those areas, in those areas, with its own rules and with actors that accumulate power and money thanks to that order. As I said, this is not a new phenomenon. However, these actors used to settle for avoiding the law, corrupt enforcement officials, or hoping to the state would turn a blind eye to them. But little by little, they started to participate in politics, particularly at the subnational level. But now they are entering national politics, and they have ties both to the right and to the left of the political spectrum. Our brown areas have nurtured brown powers, actors that have vested interest in the persistence of this informal and illegal order and that penetrated politics after decades of growing in the shadows. They are there, they were there during the brief presidency of Maria, and they are present now during Castillo's presidency. Now they don't settle for avoiding the state, but actively participate to prevent reform and any attempt at expanding the rule of law. I want to finish by saying that pluralism by default is still at work in Peru. As you know, Castillo is massively unpopular, but so is Congress, even more so. And this is why, probably one of the main reasons why Castillo has not fallen yet, because we still have this low level equilibrium among weak political actors. But of all these points, that, that all the points that I've addressed today, the one that concerns me the most is the last one about the rule of law. Without rule of law, there is no lasting democracy. And as the eyes of Peruvians are focused on whether Castillo will last five years in the presidency or five days, I worry that once he's not in power, whether it happens now or, in, or, or later, this informal and illegal interests will surely outlive his presidency and will be there waiting for the new president when he, say, when he takes oath. Thank you. Thanks, Rodrigo. Okay, our third speaker is Zaraí Toledo. Hi, thank you for the invitation, Steve. I'm, I'm really happy that uh, Gonzalo has such on current dynamics and that Rodrigo was talking about the democracy and the existence of other powers because um, it's uh, in line with what I, what I wanted to say. And I want to focus on, on trying to understand how we Peruvians got where we are right now. And so my, my argument is that uh, the political crisis in Peru is deeply rooted in the disconnection between politics and uh, the economy. So what I'm saying is that politicians do not have a say into how resources will be redistributed. They cannot participate of major economic changes. Demands for radical change do win the elections. Since the 2000s, as, as mentioned before, we had had three presidents that won office with that promise, with promise of strong economic redistribution. And more than once candidates promising strong redistributive agendas made it to the top three. Yet, when these presidents are in office, they cannot do much. They're highly constrained by the environment and end up betraying that initial promise. This has impact, one, the level of trust of the voters on parties, and two, it has taken away from politicians the possibility of winning with large minorities, which, in my opinion, further limits their capacity of action. I argue that as a result, we have a class of politicians without distinguishable and proactive political goals. In other words, they do not have significant political preferences that separates them from each other. Or if they do, such preferences are progressively in becoming narrower and narrower and are subject of negotiation. And so just to be clear, this applies to both right and left wing parties. Take Peruvian right-wing parties, for example, which have not managed to develop a new agenda. The Peru that we see now is the Peru that they're looking to preserve. We see even in Fujimorismo, the biggest and most powerful uh, right-wing party and similar mini versions, they, they change the name every election, but I promise that the same people rotating across parties, Solidaridad Nacional, Renovación Nacional, Avanza Peru, they're all committed to defend the status quo. If you ask Peruvians about what they remember from these parties, they will not be able to name one single promise. Because what is there to, to change? Peru, Peru is already playing by their rules 
and this is the game. So the focus of this part is in the uh, last years have been on stopping changes, such as reforms uh, to education or healthcare system. And for the sake of visibility, they're embracing other conservative causes that are currently mobilizing people. For example, Comisijos no Temetas, anti-gender equality uh, reforms. So my argument is that when the fight is no longer about policy preferences for redistribution, when you cannot use your power to transform present conditions, the fight moves to other arenas. In this case, it moves to the redistribution of personalistic clan interest. El conflicto siempre se desfoga por, por alguna parte. So power is used in this case, for example, to place your own people in positions of power, to lobby for a road, for una obra, for a ministry. Power is used to defend particularistic, again, clan preferences, the preferences of, as Rodrigo was saying, mafias, of a different kind of transportation, education, mining. They all have a, par, a candidate in Congress in every party. Mafias uh, give politicians what they cannot get on the run, that is money and votes in exchange for tailored policies. This is what Peruvians call la repartija. No? And this clan logic has consolidated across parties, again, from right and left wing. Consider the case, uh, for example, of La Bancada de Perú Libre, which is in Congress now, self-labeled as the real left. They could have supported a minor reform that would have increased the role of a state in society, and that is in line with the expected priorities of a left party. Yet, they highly oppose the ministers uh, chosen to do this reform, and many others, because they were from Lima, from a different group, from a different clan. They would rather have someone incompetent in the ministries, not suitable for the job and highly unpopular than a person from a different clan. So this clan logic and the fight for personalistic interests also explains why congressmen are in constant conflict with the president. It's a fight about clans and their desire to be in key position. There's no ideological conflict involved, as it was mentioned by it, uh, uh, Gonzalo and Rodrigo. Think about uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, the first president from the decade to be removed. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski and company were right wing, white, highly educated from Lima. Uh, Kuczynski spoke better English than Spanish, and no one could uh, pronounce his last name. It does not get any better than that for a conservative in Lima. Yet, he was removed from office because he was not part of that other clan that claims the monopoly of the status quo. Yes, he, he was involved in serious and real accusations of corruption, but in the past, this was not enough to remove a president from office. Now I want to refer to uh, Castillo's period because his presidency is, in my opinion, the outcome of the dynamics I just described, and at the same time, he's replicating them. First, his presidency is more the result of a high degree of unpopularity of the political class and the incapacity of the right to develop a new agenda. If in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you as, as right-wing parties were doing, you're telling Peruvians that the country is good as it is, it is very difficult to win. Second, most of the politicians in Peru are not committed to any cause. It is easy to discard them or see them in the next election in a different party. Even sometimes even they become part of the opposition or the government because there is no loyalty to the electorate or to a policy. Loyalty is uh, with different powers. It's associated to different powers. So when voters see that ideological alignment is no longer a useful category to differentiate politicians, they look for other type of associations or their other types of links to relate to politicians when voting. Castillo, I think, won the battle of identification because he does come from a highly excluded sector. So this uh, won him the support, public support, popular support, and also raised the expectations of the people and hope for ch change. Yet, when in office, Castillo is following the pattern of his predecessors. He's committed to not change anything. He does not know how, and he has realized at an early stage that he can't. 
Castillo, who every day seems to me terrified of being the president, has decided uh, then to stand still. If he stands still, nothing will happen to him or the country. The problem is that nothing is helping the country either. Instead, he's letting and enabling new clans to co opt positions of power and have their share of power. The weaker he feels, the more he's willing to concede power to these clans, to these mafias, and fall for what they want in exchange for letting them stay in office. Nevertheless, the fact that Congress wants Castillo out, again, has nothing to do with ideological principles or even with issues of corruption. I mean, think about the case of Garcia in the past. This has not been enough to remove a president from, from office. And so we have uh, more evidence on this. No, the opposition has the numbers. The, the number of uh, right-wing parties is enough to put forward reforms in Congress. They could have done this. They could have acted like that during COVID times. They could use that big majority to actually help the country, but they have not done so. And second, uh, I think the second uh, piece of evidence uh, to prove that um, Congress uh, wanting uh, Castillo out has nothing to do with ideology is that right and left parties vote together against key reforms uh, to the education and transportation. They both have personalistic interests. Congress instead is advocated to remove a person in power who's not part of their clan. Since Castillo has decided to not fight for change, he will lose the only thing that can maintain a president in office in Peru, which is popular support. My last point is that uh, to me it's inevitable not to refer to the case of Ecuador, and I'm, I'm thinking about the crisis between um, the 96 and the 2006, where we had, uh, where they had 10 presidents, uh, 10, sorry, 10 years, in 10 years they had seven presidents, I'm thinking about Bucaram, Mawat, Novoa, Gutierrez, and, and the respective uh, vice presidents that they also um, uh, were in power, and so um, it's true, we have a very different economic situation at the time Ecuador experienced a terrible economic crisis, but I see a resemblance in that political instability, the conflict was not redistributive. The constant fall of presidents was less about their agenda and more about elite alliances. Worse, without achieving real change, these presidents could never gather enough public support to defend them. On the contrary, at the end, voters supported their fall. So you see one president after the other um, going down, another one elected and nothing happened. So I wanted to conclude with this example because I think it illustrates a broader point that Ecuadorians know, and I think Peruvians were still learning, which is that constant impeachments or revocatorias led by clans, led by these elites, economic elites do not necessarily lead to better options or to a change in redistributive preferences. On the contrary, I think it consolidates, consolidates the idea that politicians are not agents of change, but just actors to place or remove whenever it's convenient to particular interests. Um, I, wanna, I wanna leave it here, thank you. Thanks. I think that um, that comparison to Ecuador is, uh, is really apt, and it's pretty depressing to know that Peru's on pace beat the uh, seven presidents in 10 years kind of set by, by Ecuador. Um, so I'm left with many questions. We also have a bunch of questions from the, um, from the audience. So let me throw out just a few, and you guys, I'm going to send them out generally. Most of them are for the group. You should answer the ones that you that you want to answer, don't feel the need to answer them all. Uh, and if you could each take um, about three minutes or so, and hopefully we'll have a couple of rounds of questions. So to begin with, there were several questions about, all of you made some reference to the, the sort of new radical right, the illiberal right and right-wing movements in, uh, in Peru. And there were several questions about this. Um, one comes from June Ehrlich who asked uh, to, to speak a little bit more about just how powerful these movements are, and, and uh, where is where is it that their that their power lies? I mean, thus far they haven't yet shown the ability to win elections. Um, secondly, I wanted to push uh, Rodrigo on this this question of where the radicalization comes from. Because I don't, I'm not satisfied with an explanation that says, well, this is happening worldwide. Because Peru has got a pretty 
pretty dignified history of resisting transnational trends, whether it's Velasco or Sendero or Fujimori, it's not obvious that what, what is de moda ideologically in the rest of the region is gonna, is gonna hit in Peru. So I'd like to hear a little bit more concretely where you think this comes from um, in, in Peru and why now? Uh, and, and third, there's a question from, uh, from the audience about whether, uh, obviously the, um, maybe this is probably an answer to the question, the, the Peruvian far right has some clear obvious ties to elements of the, of the illiberal right in the United States. Um, but now that the Biden administration's office, those ties may be more difficult to, to sustain. And the, the question was whether you, the, we might see the Peruvian right, the illiberal right turn away from the US right uh, and the Western right towards, uh, towards China and Russia. Uh, there was also a question that's a very different topic that any of you um, can feel free to, to take up is how serious we should take uh, the Castillo government's uh, Segunda Reforma Agraria uh, and its emphasis on supporting family agriculture. Is that, uh, was that pure rhetoric? Is there a policy behind it? Are there any conditions under which that can actually um, be meaningful? Third, there was a, a, a broader question I think is, is useful for all of you, which is, um, now that Castillo is in serious trouble, there's a lot of talk in Peru, a lot of expectation that we're probably headed to for uh, a, a, an election, maybe a general election. And there's actually, once again, this, uh, this uh, has a, a feel of, of, of deja vu, but a, a, a perception among many Peruvians that that's sort of the solution, that a new election this time, yeah, it, this time is gonna produce something different. And the question was full of skepticism. Was how the hell should we expect any kind of political solution from uh, another election given that the system remains the same. Um, let me throw one more question out to the group um, and, and then we'll do a second round, which is that all of you described a, a pretty significant disjuncture between a political elite that's responding to all sorts of interests, often illicit ones, very particularistic ones, maybe uh, uh, clannish ones, but there's very, very little talk of a connection between politicians and voters. And, uh, and, and we've got what, what seems to be a strikingly unresponsive political elite in terms of voters. And the question was simply, what do we know about what Peruvian voters want? What do Peruvian voters want? Um, why don't we go in the same order? So beginning with, with Gonzalo. Again, take up the question that you want to, and uh, if you can do it in about three minutes, that'd be great. Okay. Well, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I, I'm going to take the the right uh, the, uh, the, the question about the stream right in, in Peru. I think the stream right in Peru has begun to insurgence with relative success. I think that in previous extreme right movements in Peru, for instance, the insurgence of Rafael Lopez Aliaga candidacy for the first time is a huge example that we didn't have in previous years. Um, they have roots in a lot of uh, uh, a lot of movements like con mis hijos no te metas with my child don't 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 just keep away from my child no uh, but unlike uh, many years ago they have interesting capacity of mobilization no extreme right in the past has had not that uh, capability of mobilization as the left in Peru, no? And they have access to international networks, no? They are part, we, we have uh, seen this in some weeks ago with uh, the participation of Peruvian politicians in international, events of, of the far right movements. And I think, and they are organized now, they do a scratching. And another interesting thing, they have media, no? They have uh, national TV channels, no? That in, in other years, they, they, they didn't, no? And they have resources, no? Uh, 
for instance, I remember you no know, the presentation of of the uh, Francisco Sagasti's book uh, where there was a huge manifestation striking you no know, that are very fanatics you no know, that were like uh, screaming you no know, and trying to 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 address that kind of manichaean uh, speeches you no know? that kind of things we have not seen in peru i think and this is very interesting for first time in many years they have capability of mobilization, they have resources, they have media. Um, I, I think they do not have intellectuals. I, I think that's, they have the, the lack of intellectuals, um, but maybe uh, some of us could, could, could think that that's not what they have, what they want, no? But extreme right in Peru, uh, I think that in this moment are very much powerful than the previous. I don't know what my colleagues uh, think about this. Thank you, sir. Where do you? Um, it's like the the question uh, about the, the this new right, uh, this anti-communist hysteria and so on. It's it's really hard to to answer. Uh, I thought about this during the election, and uh, uh, Steve, I talked to you about this many times, trying to figure out what's happening. Um, I'm going to refer to, to broad, larger processes that I think uh, are linked to this, not perhaps explain, perhaps they don't explain the phenomenon directly, but are related to it, no, and, and nevertheless. I think in general, the, the, the right in Latin America is in a, is in a new moment it's like a post neoliberal moment right uh, in the 80s and 90s the, the 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 right had the mess left by previous governments and the left and so on to have a platform of um uh or fiscal order uh organized finances and so on and so forth and that kind of gave them a programmatic uh position from which com to compete right but after the left wave, which with very exceptional cases was in general fiscally responsible, did not leave a mess behind them, uh, the right, in particularly in a region like, like Latin America that is so unequal, was left, I think, without a position, without a programmatic position that was appealing to the masses and so on and so forth. And I think from then on, the right has been looking for an angle all these movements, uh, all these linkages that they have tried to establish, for example, to religious movements, to conservative movements and so on, is part of that tendency. The right in search for a new brand, right? It's the post neoliberal right searching for a new brand. And in terms of that, I think it might make sense uh, in the search for that brand to uh, kind of radicalize and establish linkages with more fringe actors that have more clear positions, more extreme positions. That makes sense from in terms of establishing a brand, right? And, and to that goal, they have established linkages to international actors, to they have imported part of the repertoire of mobilization from, from the international right, from the US really actually, right? The US and Europe and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that's part of it. That's part of why the right has radicalized itself. Lopez Aliaga really is like a performance of Trump. It's, it's very interesting. It's, it's almost like rehearsed in his Twitter. It's like exactly the same kind of way of writing. It's, 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 it's very obvious. Um, in terms of also like very, in terms of Peruvian ingredients to this polarization, I think there's some affective polarization. As Sarai said, Sarai said, uh, there is no programmatic polarization, really, right? In Congress, the government and Congress are, are not really that disaligned or misaligned. They are following relatively similar interests, but there is affective polarization in Peru, no doubt, right? There's this deep disgust uh, uh, towards the other side, right? If there is a Peruvian component to it in this particular administration, I think it has to do with uh, elite rejection of Pedro Castillo himself, what he represents, where he comes from. It's undeniable, I think, right? Um, 
um, uh, it's to some extent uh, el miedo al cholo, no? The fear of the cholo, the fear of the cholo in Peru. Um, so that um, and about the movements themselves, the movements on the street, which are something very odd and that again we have not seen in Peru since the 1930s. This is an open question. I, I'm really puzzled about the nature of these movements. However, they, some, some things are clear. They are, they, are, they are few. This is not, these are not massive movements. They are few, but pay attention and you will see that extreme right movements everywhere else are also composed of few members, not many, right? They are few and they are, at least it seems they are financed. And they are boosted by certain um, businessmen, um, and they do have links to political parties, to new political parties. Again, searching for a brand, right? Um, those are my thoughts on this. Are not they're they're not great, but th those are what I have. It's it's a very interesting question, a very important question, and I think uh, probably will be uh, addressed uh, much better than than, I, than what I did. Uh, by other scholars. Thanks, Rodrigo. That was great. Dr. Thaleo. Um, I agree. I mean, there are many questions, so I don't know what to answer. So I'm just going to try to comment on what I can. I, I agree with the search for 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 a brand, and uh, in, in a country where in belonging to a party, it's almost a stain you have to borrow from other groups that are actually um, doing what you can't as a party, which is to gather people around one cause, having the power to mobilize, having the power to pressure, to set an agenda. So obviously you have to clinch to them, you have to uh, associate with them because they are doing what parties used to do, which is to uh, um, get people to move around a cause. So I think that's, that's part of it. This is why you are embracing, uh, some right-wing uh, parties are embracing this agenda because uh, even it would be the same with evangelists or uh, radical uh, religious groups. They, they, they have the power to gather people, to, as a, to mobilize, even to contribute with resources economic resources. So I think that explains the, um, the alliance. Then there were some other questions that, uh, I mean, Peruvians don't, or scholars don't, don't want to touch because we don't have the answer. For example, what do Peruvians want? Um, and uh, I think this is also linked, uh, not that I will have the perfect answer, but I, I think this is also linked with a common um, description that I always hear, which is that uh, Peruvians do not mobilize, right? Compared to Chile, compared to Colombia, compared to Bolivia, we don't have that same power of mobilization, many say. But I actually think that it, it's pretty straightforward what, what, what Peruvians want. Th this is a country that has had the highest number of conflicts since the 2000, and those are uh, related with mostly redistribution and participation. The, those conflicts are um, most of the time centered around natural resources because that is uh, one of the pillars of our economy. But because of that thing, they also, these conflicts expose the biggest tensions in Peru, which are again, in my opinion, around redistribution of resources and about participation, which has characterized also politics in Lima, which is that uh, politics are reserved to a minority, to a group uh, that wears uh, saco y corbata, and that doesn't take into account any other any other voice and any other version. And the other the other piece of evidence that can help us understand what Peruvians want are uh, national elections themselves. So no matter what media tell us, I think most of the time the candidates that have made it to the runoff or um, or that uh, are in the first top three are the ones that propose the most changes and the most radical changes. Even to make it to the runoff, Alan Garcia in the second period had to talk and, and say, I am a different type of left, I'm a cambio responsable. They, they know that they have to appeal with that, to that, you know. In the last election, Kiko Fujimori had to embrace uh, certain uh, policy programs that were from the Ojanta period because there is that need, because they are high, like they're very conscious that society wants that redistribution and inclusion. 
Of course, I think there's also a need for very to pay attention to very basic needs in terms of security, in terms of employment. And I think there's a great degree of disconnection between what uh, parties have been doing versus these, these concerns. But I, in, in the way I see it, uh, I think Peruvians uh, have made it very clear since the 2000 what, uh, what they want. You know? Thanks. I'm going to pass the baton to my colleague, Fran Gobi. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to all the panelists. I'm a non-Peru expert here, so I came to learn and I feel like I learned a lot, but I still have a lot of questions as well. So let me um, first have a couple of questions, present a couple of questions from the audience, but then if I can interject a comparative perspective and try to push all of you a little bit, um, Bear with me, I would, I would enjoy that. So first, there were a couple of questions from the panelists that, um, and no one talked about institutions here. Um, you were mostly all focused on power and um, conflict. And so is there any, um, do you see any solution in the way in which powers are apportioned between the legislature and the president? Um, is there some way out of the impasse that nothing can get done in Peru um, you've analyzed why nothing can get done in Peru, but if you shifted power between one branch or another of government, would that have an impact? There were a couple of questions about this. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out what's really different about Peru. And if I go back 40 years, there was something, um, Rodrigo's comment about the Cholo, the fear of the Cholo brought back to me sort of what it was like in Bolivia and in Peru in this time when this was all unspoken. And um, I remember the show, I spent some time in Bolivia, and I remember the shock of just how white people talked about the Cholo. And um, this, this leads me, what, what was different about Peru was that in Peru, there were no parties representing um, indigenous peoples at all. It was something that just wasn't discussed. Um, and the world has changed, but I wonder if it's changed in a way that has divided what one, might think, what one might think about is the political spectrum to the left of Fujimorismo. And here's what I mean. What I mean is that, um, that there are, I'm wondering when you say that, that people don't agree on or people, everyone agrees. I'm not sure that everyone agrees. Everyone agrees not to agree on a path forward, but they might be disagreeing for different reasons. And so what I'm wondering is if there are divisions within the center left, I'll just call it, um, about between the regions and Lima. If it's not good enough, maybe the ministers are being rejected, not because they're from the same clan. I actually wanted to ask you more, Zarai, about your very interesting argument about the clans, because I'm not sure I've completely grasped it and exactly who the clans are. But one possibility is that people aren't from the same group. The other is that there's a genuine regional cleavage in Peru, and there are people who are really angry that the elite are always from Lima, and that they've been promised now that regional interests will be taken seriously. So why nominate a minister from Lima? I'm not gonna support that person. I want these people to take us seriously that they need to pay attention to the provinces. So I'm wondering if you think about provincial Lima, if you think about informal formal sector, maybe you don't get education reform because there's formal sector teachers who don't want reform. I don't know anything about the Peruvian educational reforms, but I'm just saying that it could be that there are a lot of divisions within this center left group that is preventing the cohesion of a center left platform. Where you, Rodrigo gave a very interesting answer to what's going on in the right and why isn't there a program. But there isn't a coherent, I don't see a coherent program coming from the center left, which is why there were so many different fragments of leftist candidacies from the point of view of an amateur um, in this election, because there's real cleavages in Peruvian society that in a way have not been dealt with. So that's that's sort of my, um, my, my question here. But um, I'm also be interested to know, uh, and here I guess I would direct this question to Zarai, um, are these clans, are these, are these really clans in the sense the economic elite always hang together? 
or are they clans in the sense, are they willing to switch sides as long as they stay in power? I mean, it's not clear to me, it wasn't clear to me. Um, I'm sure you were saying something very sophisticated, um, but I'm just trying to learn and follow um, whether there could just be differences going on or whether there is some coherent group, some coherent clan. So that's sort of where I, I'd like to just come in and get some. So I'm just trying to understand why is Peru in such trouble? when um wh why are parties so unpopular they're, they're not popular anywhere in latin america but they're they've always been unpopular well i don't know about always but since fujimori since fujimori defeated the partido Cracia, it seems like the parties have never been come, really come back since maybe it's gotten worse in the last few years but um there's been no strengthening of parties and it seems to me there's got to be it's interesting to comment on that but we have to understand why and I don't understand why. Illuminate me. In three minutes or less. Okay, I'm going to try it. Um, first, I think that Peruvian Peruvian didn't want, didn't know what what we want, but we know what we don't want. That's an interesting, I think, first topic. No. Uh, political parties identities in Peru are not strong, but anti-vote, no, anti-identities, yes, they are strong. That's first of all, I think. Second, uh, the cleavage between Lima and regions of Peru. Okay, I think this is a, 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 a continuous path in our recent elections. But I think that it, that's that's the kind of things that 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 causes that Castillo have been elected. But we have to consider that Castillo was elected only with fifteen percent in the first round. Uh, what I'm what I'm saying is that okay, uh, Castillo came from the highlands, from the countryside of Peru. Okay, he's a rural teacher. But he had only 15% in the first round. What I'm saying is that in other election, in other normal election in Peru, he probably he, he, he couldn't be in the second round. Yeah, well, it's that I think that that's an interesting thing. No, because in this particular election, Castillo had chances because all political parties were very diminished were very weak and that's the second argument and the third argument i think that yes castillo has the right to appoint uh regional politicians but the thing with castillo it has he has not he had not appointed uh, regional only regional politicians but their uh, allies their supporters their uh, there are a lot of incapabilities in their uh, followers, but I think that that's the key issue on Castillo's nominations. Castillo has all the right to nominate regional politicians, but capable, not only to, 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 to distribute power, to pay some favors in the campaign. I, I think that's the problem. You can have regional minister, regional politician to address, to tackle regional regional troubles. Okay, um, I agree with that, but uh, Castillo is not doing that. Castillo is only distributing power, not to capable uh, politician, if not people who have support him in the campaign. Okay, should I go? Yes. Yes, All sir. Right. Uh, so about institutions, um, Fran asked about institutions, what can we say about that? Um, you know, when I was preparing this, this presentation, I remembered a colleague um, in Ecuador uh, during when I was doing fieldwork for my dissertation that told me the Peruvian institutional design is so great and I think that is the reason why you have so much stability, right? You have the prime minister and that kind of like shields the president from falling like we have had this like like we like we experienced here in Ecuador but Peruvian institutions have this 
way of, of diffusing tension and so on and so forth. Um, and the constitution seemed seem, seem fine and our institutional mechanisms for diffusing conflict seem to be working. What I, what I mean by this is, I don't know, it may be, it may be that I, I'm growing uh, more and more uh, skeptic about institutional approaches, at least formal institutions. But I think institutions are very fluid, more so in Latin America, and they can be redeployed, right? We are seeing how politicians are uh, uh, finding new interpretations for articles in the Constitution so that they can mean something else. They are doing so as we speak in Congress right now, right? Uh, so the strength of institutions, I think it, it won't hold on hold off politicians from, from taking this conflict one step further. About the fear of the Cholo that I mentioned, it's a way of talking about these deep cleavages that Francis just mentioned, right? This regional, ethnic, class cleavages that we have in Peru and that are very evident, right? At the same time, they are not directly uh, politicized. They have, not, they have not been directly politicized in Peru ever, I think, right? Uh, as, it, as it has been the case in Bolivia in recent history, right? In, in Peru, it's more like a latent cleavage, right? And it's more like a mute language that politicians speak to when they talk to voters and vice versa. But I think it's very clear. In particular, it's very clear once one leaves the country for a while and goes back, right? And you see uh, those cleavages in action in, in the way people speak and in performance and so on and so forth. These cleavages are so important that I think shape in part what Francis said, the incapacity for the left to come up with a programmatically coherent um, platform, right? The center left is actually a liberal left, right? Which is mostly which has most of its voters in urban areas, middle class, in the coast, right? So this left that is centered on middle class voters, highly educated, um, doesn't necessarily match with this other traditional left that is more conservative, more traditional, um, non-progressive if you want, right? And this difference is not just something that we can see in Peru, of course. Uh, uh, this, this, this connection between certain um, sectors of, of, of elites or left that have a, a growing core constituency in the middle class, but it is kind of like uh, moving the left away from uh, certain sectors in the working class is not something just uh, pertaining to Peru, but everywhere, uh, but in many other countries. The, the US included, right? So um, I think those cleavages uh, are at work, are preventing um, what, what uh, kind of like a more coherent um, government platform, right? Uh, the, the disputes within the government become a thing, become a dispute about uh, excluding or not limeños, excluding or not caviares, right? Which is basically the, the um, uh, a way of talking about these Deep, these deep cleavages. Um, I don't understand why Peruvian parties cannot recover from this kind of uh, low level of support and, and weakness that you've mentioned, started with Fujimori. Um, it, uh, it, you know, an easy answer is just path dependence, right? Um, uh, Steve uh, and Mauricio Zavaleta wrote a, a chapter on why politicians have no incentives to build parties uh, in, in a book that Steve uh, and others edited not, not long ago, but voters. It's very interesting why voters keep betting on new politicians every, sing every five years, right? Um, but it's something that I have no intelligent answer to. So I'm just gonna um, be with you in the hopes that somebody answered that question. By the way, path dependence isn't the easy answer, it's the right answer for you. All right, then I answered it. Can I tell, can I go? 
Um, uh, I, I, I just I want to briefly answer uh, the I, I fully agree with what Rodrigo said, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the comparison uh, between the Bolivian case and the uh, and Peru and the idea of those cleavages, and I think uh, a lot of people thought and wanted to see really bad uh, Morales in Castillo, and that triggered several comparisons. And it is the cleavages, the ethnic, the class cleavages are real. In, in both countries. A key difference, however, is that those cleavages uh, when in power uh, were translated into particular agendas in the case of Bolivia, that translated into a set of policies that are clearly identified um, and that directly speak to a sector of society. I'm talking about an agenda on uh, cultural recognition, issues of participation, um, recognition of uh, the union, you can think about uh, the coca leaf policies. The, you can see how cleavages are connected to a particular set of policies. I, I don't think that has been the case here. Um, the preferences of Castillo are not necessarily linked with those cleavages or are not answering to those to a particular constituency. Uh, he, uh, as, as I said, he, he just, uh, he's standing still <laughs> and letting whoever uh, offers him support to go away with what they want. It could be with a ministry, it would be passing or stopping a reform. So, so we don't really see him putting forward or the people of his party of Peru Libre putting forward an agenda and that uh, it's in line with that. Even the idea of la reforma agraria, it was a good idea that could, an idea that could receive a lot of support from those who voted for him, did not really translate into a reform. It was, uh, I think there were the initiatives about uh, cheap credit, which already exist. And you don't see really a transformation um, around on that now th there were uh, there was a couple of, there were a couple of questions related with uh, uh, clans and on what what did I what did I mean uh, with this um, and I, what I mean by clans are are to me these are groups of power uh, both political political and economic that claim the monopoly or the control over certain sector or policy issue. It could be uh, you claim the, the status quo. I'm responsible for uh, the Peru that we have now. This is a, this is a, a claim that many politicians in Fujimorismo uh, say, you no, know, we are where we are now because, because of us. And so that impedes them to uh, build coalitions with others that they do not see them as part of their clan. You could also find clans, clans across parties. As, as, as we mentioned it, there is a, um, there's a lot of activism across parties against the reform uh, for transportation. This is the union of different interests that have nothing to do with uh, ideological components. This is just about particular economic interests. And um, I, I hope that clarifies the concept. Lastly, uh, there were two words mentioned by, by France uh, that I don't know and I don't understand, which is institutions and the center. That doesn't exist. <laughs> I agree with, with, uh, with Rodrigo that uh, if, if anything, institutions are fluid or are subject of interpretation on a daily basis. And the center is whoever, um, whoever, um, whoever stands still and doesn't do anything until it's very late and so you can go with the right path or what is popular at the moment. But, but that's, that's about it. Well, that was depressing. Uh, thanks very much to Zaray Toledo Rojo, Rodrigo Baranchea, and Gonzalo Banda. Um, keep in mind that there is a, uh, a pretty good inverse relationship between the state of Peruvian politics and the quality of its football team. So um, that may point to a decent Mundial. Um, I want to just very quickly announce next week's uh, Tuesday webinar, which will be uh, Dr. Castizzi scholar Santiago Andrea, who will be speaking about Latin America after the left turn. So once again, thanks to everyone. Many, many thanks to our three panelists. Uh, it's been a, a really insightful and enjoyable day. Take care, everybody.